Chapter Five of Mademoiselle Ix by Lenoy Falconer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The discovery which Evelyn had made afforded her very great delight. Romances in fiction were familiar enough to her, but a romance in real life, in full play before her, that was indeed an experience as new as it was enchanting her chief anxiety was how to know something of the past that she might the more intelligently follow the present progress of this moving drama and she would have made an attempt to do so could she have secured an undisturbed interview with the heroine herself but for this opportunity the time was highly unfavourable the next day the day of the dance was one of wild confusion and scurry in this neighbourhood it was impossible to offer any form of hospitality to less than the entire visitable population without seriously offending all the others it was a tiresome state of things highly discouraging to social enterprise but such was the feeling and it made itself so distinctly felt on this occasion and was so hastily succumbed to by mrs merrington that by tuesday the projected dance had assumed the proportions of a ball a great many people condemned mrs merrington for giving an entertainment in lent at all but very few carried their disapprobation so far as to abstain from being present mr and mrs barnes were amongst this consistent number and mrs barnes indeed appended to her answer to mrs merrington's invitation in a postscript often triumphantly quoted by herself in time to come her earnest hope that this daring desecration of the sacred season might not draw down upon the house some signal judgment in spite of this the sanction of the church was in a measure secured by the promised appearance of mr golding whose dislike of dancing had been outweighed by his still greater horror of anything so popish as lenten observance with the invitation the preparations had of course correspondingly multiplied and on tuesday morning much yet remained to do to add to mrs merrington's anxieties winifred was worse rather than better and was now confined to bed her mother could have been tempted at least to defer the ball if it had not been for mademoiselle ix who gave her other pupils a holiday and established herself by winifred's cot for the greater part of the day to evelyn was committed the task of decorating the hall and it was lunch-time before she and her assistants had draped the railings of both gallery and staircase and framed every window and doorway with wreaths of vivid green spangled here and there with balls of crimson white and yellow flowers i think it is very pretty indeed said mrs merrington at lunch but i wish you had put a wreath round the tapestry picture over the staircase it seems to want something but mamma i have not flowers enough and a plain green wreath would look quite funereal round that faded tapestry if daffodils would be suitable suggested mademoiselle ix there are plenty to be found at the beeches yes they might do said evelyn rather coldly the truth is i don't much care for decorating that horrid picture horrid picture my dear evelyn repeated mrs merrington i assure you it is thought very highly of by connoisseurs mr dacre said he never saw a piece of that period so well preserved it is the subject i don't like i hate jail why do you hate her asked mademoiselle ix because she killed sisera in such a mean way perhaps it was the only way in which she could kill him why should she kill him at all because he was the enemy of her people you appear to forget evelyn said her mother in a tone of grave displeasure that jael was not an ordinary person fortunately not observed mr merrington dryly as she would not have been a pleasant person to meet in ordinary society perhaps monsieur you might have found her very pleasant had you met her in ordinary society said mademoiselle ix with a smile i do not think it right said mrs merrington now seriously displeased to talk of scripture characters as if they were living people like ourselves and we know that jael must have been a good woman for the bible says she was blessed in the silence which followed freddy who had been twice checked during the last three minutes for attempting to interrupt his elders was now able to make himself heard 
mamma i can get daffodils for evelyn there are lots down at the beeches the little girls were equally obliging for heaven's sake let them go said mr merrington who had been banished from his study to a room just under the schoolroom gallery and stay out as late as ever you can my dear how can you say so said mrs merrington on the contrary they must be in early for freddy seems inclined to have a cold yes my darling you are i heard you sneezing this morning mademoiselle i think you had better go with them i will take care of winifred this afternoon and i will go too said evelyn readily discerning some chance of seeing mademoiselle eats alone accordingly at about three o'clock the expedition started it was first delayed by a little dispute as to the route which should be followed freddy was extremely anxious that they should proceed to the beeches by going down the park road through the lodge gates and along the carchester high road but as this was by far the longer of the two possible ways and as freddy had no better reason to offer for selecting it than his own interest in a ferret being reared for him at the lodge his proposal was unanimously negatived they went around to the back of the house and passed through the shrubberies and the kitchen garden into the park a little footpath led them across a broad stretch of sward and after climbing a high fence they found themselves in the wood which at this side separated the park from the high road a narrow path through this wood widened at last into a broad avenue of grand old trees renowned far and wide for its beauty and commonly called the beeches the mossy ground was still littered with the crisp brown leaves of late autumn but above them the fresh spring daffodils rose brightly in clusters of shining yellow the children plunged gleefully into the copse and gave themselves much needless trouble in struggling through the thicket evelyn and mademoiselle Ix pursued their task more tranquilly gathering the flowers which grew thickly on either side till their baskets were filled and they had reached the spot where the avenue opened on to the high road here they sat down on the stumps of a felled tree to wait for the children it was a still soft day the clouds had brooded low and grey since early morning at evening it would rain but of this moody sky they could see nothing where they sat with an impenetrable network of branches and stems above and around them just under their fringe was visible the flat white road itself the russet hedge and beyond that rich brown fallow and dun-coloured sward fading at last into the cloudy blue of far-off woods against the pale horizon mademoiselle Ix, supporting her chin upon her hand looked thoughtfully towards the road and evelyn observing her acknowledged to herself that the favourable moment had now arrived but how to begin it was mademoiselle Ix who spoke first this is the road by which i came from carchester i think yes mademoiselle carchester lies to the right of us i think yes mademoiselle and lingford and lingford castle though on the same road are situated in exactly the opposite direction are they not yes mademoiselle how well you seem to know this country already you must have what papa calls the bump of locality it is a gift which i have cultivated i have found it very useful in what way mademoiselle well i have had to find my way about in strange places at all hours of the night and day when it would have been dangerous for me to ask my way it was no longer possible for evelyn to be startled at anything mademoiselle Ix could say but this remarkable statement offered her an excuse for observing in return surely mademoiselle your life has been different from that of most governesses mademoiselle Ix, after a pause answered i have not always been a governess oh at one time i was a sick nurse yes mademoiselle before that i was a laundress mademoiselle impossible not at all impossible i did my work very well too i assure you but mademoiselle surely you who are so well educated and accomplished could have found an easier way of, of of making money i did not want to make money then what could i beg your pardon mademoiselle do not beg my pardon said mademoiselle Ix, gently stretching out her hand 
to touch evelyn's caressingly for a moment i am willing to tell you as much of myself and my past as i may i like you she went on using as she spoke french the word which means love as well as like you are one of the flowers that i have found between the stones upon the rough pathway of my life dear little flower when we are no longer together think gently of me dear mademoiselle cried evelyn seized and mastered at once by the old irresistible charm why do you say that i hope we may be together for a long time we may hope but we can never confide in the future said mademoiselle Ix. but to return to that of which you spoke to me i lived and worked amongst the miserable the better to serve them not to give them alms understand me well but counsel in my country the people lie crushed beneath a tyranny so monstrous that their souls like their bodies are but half alive who shall inspire them with the breath of life the desire of freedom that they may rise and deliver themselves and take their true place amongst the nations of europe happily there are thousands who now labour to kindle amongst them the sacred fire of national life thousands who for the people's sake have left father and mother and brother and sister wealth and pleasure and ease had the range of evelyn's ideas and interests been a little less narrow had she been in the habit of reading anything besides stories in the magazines or fashionable gossip in the papers had she been awake to the throes and pangs which now convulse the national life of countries less happy than her own this speech might have revealed to her the nationality and true character of the woman beside her but evelyn cared for none of these things she classed them all under the name politics which to her meant anything that was dry lifeless and prosaic of the wide kingdom of romance she knew as yet but one small domain she had now prepared herself for a love story she was waiting impatiently for its development and it seemed to her that mademoiselle Ix had wandered from the real point she made an attempt to recall her but mademoiselle tell me about yourself since you say i may ask what were you to begin with i was the child of noble parents wealthy and in high position ah were you happy in your home yes my father was severe but just my mother tenderness itself my sisters older than i was spoilt me we lived in a lovely country home in the bright season and i studied and read and dreamt the summer away in the woods we spent the winter in in one of the gayest capitals in europe my existence was a perpetual fete i passed from one gay scene to another balls theatres operas ah how ravishing the world seemed to me then i imagined that was human life the dream was pleasant while it lasted well mademoiselle well one day i awoke i heard a voice at last thought evelyn he is coming a voice she continued rather dreamily which gradually drowned all others and one night i obeyed it when all were sleeping around me in the house i rose i clothed myself in the coarse garments of a peasant i stole from my father's house never to return obedient to this voice i ceased to live for myself i embraced poverty and toil suffering and danger some day it will call me to the scaffold and i shall go willingly and this voice said evelyn timidly bashfully conscious of speaking like a sentimental book but at a loss how otherwise to word her question this was the voice of love was it not of love repeated mademoiselle Ix slowly yes of love the last the supreme love on whose altar we emulate all others her eyes turned towards the meeting line of earth and heaven dilated and kindled her lips parted in a rapturous smile and so irradiated was the whole face that evelyn watching and marvelling wondered if this could be the same woman she and others had called common-looking it was indeed the same transfigured as even amidst the darkest errors of faith and of practice men may be transfigured by the glow of self-forgetful passion 
but the little mole beside her still misunderstanding still burrowing after her love story made a second and less fortunate venture was it the voice of the count mademoiselle the effect of her own words bewildered evelyn she hardly recognized the cold set face that turned slowly towards her of whom are you speaking i beg your pardon stammered evelyn in great confusion i thought perhaps as you seemed interested in the count mrs fox's friend i mean at least you knew something about him i am sorry if i have said anything to displease you mademoiselle i am not displeased with you dear said mademoiselle ix gently she saw the girl was frightened and smiled reassuringly but the smile kind as it was did not soften the look of stern determination her features had assumed for a few minutes she remained silent looking thoughtfully before her like one who had fallen into a reverie and that not a happy one the silence was broken by the voices of the children re-emerging from the depths of the wood mademoiselle ix roused herself at the sound and looking evelyn full in the face said in a business-like tone you startled me just now because my thoughts were so far away from that of which you spoke you have divined aright i am interested in the count but my interest is not a personal one i am charged with a message for him from others i seek an opportunity to deliver it perhaps you may have an opportunity to-night said evelyn much relieved to find the little cloud was so quickly dispersed i hope so i should like to hear you give it you shall then the children appeared laden with daffodils and wrangling loudly over a basket which had been upset by freddy unintentionally he declared designedly said the others the dispute broke out afresh several times on the way home and was only forgotten when the business of tying the daffodils into bunches absorbed their fingers and their energies in the hall they found perry already as evelyn hospitably remarked he had driven over early in his dog-cart as he explained in order to be useful he was taken at his word and thanks to his exertions the gigantic wreath was fastened round the tapestry in good time then evelyn was free to devote herself to the study of her own adorning and she went upstairs to inspect the contents of a certain wooden box which had arrived that morning from london her thoughts had been pretty equally divided all day hitherto between the approaching dance and mademoiselle ix's love story but the latter was swept entirely from her mind by the sight of her first real evening dress as she herself called it it lay outspread upon the bed by susan's reverent hands and shimmered through the dusk like a frosted snowdrift to a little girl who had never worn anything finer than a home-made muslin it was an entrancing sight still more so when it invested the slender form for which it had been made as then it was discovered that not only the gown but the wearer looked lovely such at least was the pleasant assurance of the tall mirror as evelyn gave one swift questioning glance into it before leaving her room in obedience to more than one imperative summons evelyn perhaps assigned more than its due to the effect of her dress but her rosebud-like beauty was indeed all the brighter for its setting of filmy and glistering white the consciousness of looking so fair was a little intoxicating she felt as if she had been drinking sparkling wine when she passed hurriedly into the gallery of the hall the familiar home scene shining with lights and flowers and already filled below by a gay and chattering crowd showed like a stage especially prepared for her triumph a long premonitory and suggestive note from the violin made her young nerves quiver with pleasure she went downstairs feeling and indeed looking as if she skimmed rather than trod the solid earth on the last step perry was waiting for her evelyn he began beseechingly you are going to give me the first waltz are you not but evelyn when in high spirits was especially disposed to torment him don't be tiresome perry i want to see something of other people to-night why can't you waltz with some girl you don't meet every day 
as she spoke she turned her head inquiringly around and encountered the gaze of two handsome and admiring eyes they belong to mr fox's cousin captain leslie who had just arrived in mr fox's train mr fox who wearied of waiting for his wife had started with all his guests but one leaving her to follow with the count at this moment stage whispers from above became distinctly audible the children whose share in the festivity was to wear their best clothes and look on at the dancing from the gallery were piteously entreating the tender-hearted perry to bring them some ices on this errand of mercy he accordingly departed and returned to find evelyn dancing with the owner of the admiring eyes perry danced at mrs merrington's request with one of the miss heralds who spoke of him afterwards as a young man who seemed to grow duller with years after that he found himself compelled to conduct a matron of some local importance through a square dance and then he was free to attack evelyn again but evelyn was in a more uncompromising mood than ever captain leslie was quite the most fascinating man this not very experienced young lady had met he talked as well as he danced seasoning his conversation with witty anecdotes and descriptions and skilfully conveying without direct compliment his deep appreciation of his charming partner evelyn was by no means disposed to exchange him for perry so that unfortunate young man was again dismissed on some pretext which looked as flimsy as it was mrs cosmo fox was the last to arrive accompanied by the count who beside her looked not unlike a satyr attendant on a goddess late i wasn't the least late only cosmo was in his usual frantic hurry to be off in london i assure you mrs merrington if it was not for me we should arrive everywhere before they had lit the candles but how prettily you have done the hall up well done evelyn dear mrs merrington what has mrs harold got on her head i never saw anything so wonderful and why does miss duncombe with her complexion and at her time of life wear white who on earth is that man in the corner frowning the new clergyman at barton i'm glad barton is not our parish but we are losing this divine waltz count and meeting lady duncombe's eye she added hastily the count is engaged to me for all the round dances and then as lady duncan herself afterwards described it she seized the unfortunate man by the arm and led him off without a blush lady duncan had the more excuse for her censure as this was the third dance her daughter had looked on at from a side seat and there was that lazy mr lethbridge lounging in the doorway mrs merrington herself was struck by this incongruity perry dear she said not too carefully examining his countenance would you mind dancing this waltz with miss duncan to perry smarting under a sense of hourly accumulating wrong this innocent speech appeared the crowning injury of the evening no mrs merrington he said savagely excuse me but i will do nothing of the kind he turned and strode away leaving mrs merrington transfigured with amazement a clue to the mystery was almost immediately supplied by lady duncan really my dear mrs merrington evelyn has made quite a conquest this is the sixth time she has danced has she not with that tall friend of mr fox's mrs merrington who had been too busy catering for other people's daughters to pay much attention to her own heard these words with some dismay following the direction of lady duncan's not too benevolent gaze she beheld evelyn leaning against the wall in a pretty attitude of coquettish nonchalance while captain leslie fanned her assiduously to put an end to this was mrs merrington's first impulse and with more than usual readiness she bethought herself of an excuse for so doing she threaded her way through the dancers to the somewhat conspicuous couple and after apologizing to captain leslie for interrupting his waltz directed evelyn to go and fetch mademoiselle Ix. she promised to come down for supper and it is very nearly supper time now insist upon her coming dear and make her come with you winifred is asleep i know and susan is in the next room may i take you into supper whispered captain leslie as evelyn turned to go 
but evelyn in whom the spirit of coquetry was now fully alight only turned on him an arch look which might mean either no or yes but which he of course determined to interpret as consent at the foot of the stairs she came face to face with an admirer in a very different temper do you mean to let me take you into supper said parry fiercely not if you look so cross said evelyn flippantly as she fled upstairs leaving him also prepared to maintain that he had been accepted evelyn as the red swing door closed behind her seemed to have passed from one sphere of existence to another so still and so dark felt the children's corridor after the brightness the music and the cheerful hum of voices in the hall mademoiselle x mademoiselle x she cried tapping at her door mamma has sent me to fetch you come at once hush said mademoiselle x opening the door you will waken winifred i come this instant she went back to her dressing-table to put some finishing touches to her dress and fasten something into the as usual clumsily made bodice of her black evening gown she gave a hurried glance round as if to satisfy herself that she had forgotten nothing extinguished the lights and then followed evelyn from the room i must give one look at winifred she said as they passed the nursery door which was ajar and they both went in the fire in the grate was flameless the room was dark save for the night light which flickered feebly in one corner mademoiselle x carried it to the bedside and let its light rest for an instant on the sleeping child she touched tenderly and tentatively the little forehead and hand and lingered for a space which to the impatient girl in the doorway seemed unreasonably long it is after events that have stamped this on evelyn's mind she lives through it all often enough she stands in the hushed chamber and hears the soft breathing of the child and the far-off wail of the violins in the hall and she sees mademoiselle x's changeful face as she best loves to remember it with a downward gaze mild and benignant as that of a madonna but at the time itself she noted little of what she saw she stood outwardly fidgeting inwardly chafing at the delay impatient to resume her part in the little comedy downstairs when they passed through the red door together the music had ceased and the people were streaming across the hall to the supper-room mr merrington with mrs fox on his arm led the way mademoiselle x very slowly descending the stairs and evelyn treading close upon her heels and peeping over her shoulder beheld parry and captain leslie standing sentinel-wise at the foot of the stairs both evidently expecting and intending to take her into supper suddenly mrs fox's voice rang through the hall count count she cried looking over her shoulder i have left my fan my gold fan in the drawing-room please get it mademoiselle x stopped abruptly halfway down the stairs something apparently had become disarranged in the front of her gown and must be set aright evelyn waiting behind her furtively observed with amusement tempered by dismay her rival admirers below parry the image of sullen and captain leslie of bland determination she wished herself well out of the dilemma and looked up to see why mademoiselle x still hesitated mademoiselle can, can i help you to the sentence remained unfinished mademoiselle x's head was now so turned that the profile was visible to evelyn and the look upon that profile was so unlike anything the girl had ever yet beheld on any human face that it arrested even at that moment her distracted attention strangely startled alarmed even though without being conscious why she turned quickly to see on whom or on what this ruthless gaze was bent the hall was almost empty for every one but parry and captain leslie had gone in to supper at this instant the count appeared in the drawing-room doorway exactly opposite to where they stood mrs fox's gold fan was gleaming in his brown hand ah thought evelyn with a flash of recognition the count the message at the same moment a loud crash beside her made her start convulsively and she saw the count stagger forwards throw up his arms wildly and then fall helplessly to the ground 
End of chapter 5